So this short video will be on calculating the capital asset pricing model or CAPM. The CAPM is part of the equation that's needed to figure out what the cost of equity is. And eventually when you're trying to figure out how much to discount down uh, future cash flows when you're doing, let's say, a free cash flow to equity valuation, um, this, among some other things, is going to be uh, part of the equation. So capital asset pricing model or CAPM is basically using a couple different things. It's using the risk-free rate, the beta, and I'll explain that, the expected market return. And the risk-free rate normally is going to be equal to, let's say, a three-month treasury bill. Why is it risk-free? Well, one, it's fully backed by the U.S. government. Uh, we can always print money, so to speak, so we don't default on those. But the idea is there's no default risk. And because the duration is so low, three months, you really don't have much interest rate risk at all because if you buy it, interest rates go up you know, on, on three-month rates or two-month rates. Then in three months, you, you go and you buy the next one. So that's considered the risk-free rate of return. And some people use a, a one-year treasury, and you know I suppose that's fine too. But um, generally, you know the three-month bill, one-year bill is probably fine as well. All right. If we look at the formula, it's uh, what do we got here? Well, the expected return of an asset is equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta times the expected market return minus the risk-free rate. Or uh, another way to look at this, and it's probably, I'll speak on why this is probably a better way to look on it in a second, but the expected return of an asset where the risk-free rate plus the beta times um, just what we'll call the straight equity risk premium. And it's really how much more return is required versus the risk of a, you know, a risk-free T-bill. And so the idea is, hey, I'm going to hold stocks. That's not riskless. So I should expect a higher return than the risk-free rate because of the risk that I'm taking on. And that expected return is sort of what we're trying to solve for. So the way this formula, you know, there's a couple different ways to, that it's written, but uh, if we look at the expected return, so ER equals R with the small f plus beta. And I wrote in the, the times sign there, but normally it's just the beta and the times is implied when you match it up against the parentheses but the expected return to the market minus the risk-free rate. Now, the beta, by the way, is compared to the S&P 500. Uh, we're comparing how much more volatile is the stock compared to the market. When we say the market, we mean the S&P 500. So a beta of 1.5 means one and a half times the volatility of the S&P. And if I have a, a higher beta than one, I'm going to require a higher return than I, if I was just holding, let's say, a market portfolio or maybe an ETF or a mutual fund that just mirrors the S&P 500. And so let's go into an example on this now. Let's say that our risk-free rate is, uh, let's make it 3%. And let's say the expected return of the market, we're going to say that's, uh, what are we going to say? Oh, let's make it about 11%, okay? And we're going to say the beta on the stock that we're trying to figure out is 1.3. So if we do the formula on this, we're going to say what? We're going to say 3% plus the beta of 1.3 times. Remember, the time sign normally isn't there, but it's implied. But I'll put it in. And let's say our expected return minus the risk-free rate. So this winds up being 3% plus 1.3 times 8%, 11 minus 3. And so we wind up with uh, 3% plus, and 1.3 times 8 is going to be 10.4, 10.4%. And so our required rate of return for a stock with a beta of 1.3, expected market return of 11%, and a risk-free rate of 3% is going to be 13.4, okay? So, all right, so you say, that's great, that works, um, I see that. And so if the market is, 
requiring me to have a certain return, then I'll need a higher return because I have a higher beta. Okay. So here's where a little bit of controversy on the risk-free rate. I'm sorry, the, uh, the capital asset pricing model or, or CAPM, as we'll say. And chances are when you're first learning this, they're going to give you the things that I just gave you there. Um, they're going to give you the expected return of the market and the risk-free rate and a beta, and you're going to have to figure it out. But it's this last section here, this part here. There, there's a challenge with this, and the challenge is that we really don't know what the risk premium is going to be. If we look at you know 2008 till about 2000 through the end of 2018, it was f pretty high, and part of that was the risk premium rate was so low. Historically, you know, going back to the 1920s through last year, it was more like, you know, six and a half, seven percent ish. Uh, last I checked on some of the numbers. And so the controversy on using the expected return minus the risk free rate is that, remember, our cost of equity, once you get into intrinsic equity valuation by discounting down expected growth in free cash flows to equity, is that the higher that number is, the higher the required return is, the less value future cash flows are. Remember, when you're discounting something down to the present, the higher the interest rate is, the more you have to discount it down. But let's look at this. Let's say our risk-free rate, instead of um, 3%, let's say our risk-free rate is equal to 10%. And we know normally that, let's say, inflation jumped up. We would expect the front end of the curve, uh, you know, the three-month bill to, to reflect the, the inflation expectations. So we're going to say the risk-free rate, if we use the, the formula in the same way, and we say, well, the expected return of the market is 11% on our beta is 1.3 again, right? So what happens here? Well, here we have 10%. Plus what? Well, it's 1.3 times 11% minus 10%. Okay, well, this is getting interesting. Let's see what happens here. 10% plus 1.3 times, and we did the uh, math there, so that's 1%. So 1 1.3, 10. What is that going to be? 11.3%. 11.3 is less than 13.4%. And so if you're discounting free cash flows to equity, we know the, the cost of equity probably should go up because the interest rates went up, the risk-free rates go up, and there has to be some sort of a premium above risk-free rate. But if you do it this way, it's just going to simply, uh, you know, give you, it's actually going to give you higher value of future free cash flows to equity, and that shouldn't be the case. So really, when we're talking about this part of the, the formula, um, this part of the formula, a lot of people just, instead of doing the expected return minus the risk free rate, they're just using a historical risk premium. And there's actually been a lot written on it. If you Google equity risk premium puzzle, you'll find quite a bit on it. But if we come out and let's say we just assume, okay, we're going to use an 8% equity risk premium irregardless of what the risk-free rate is. Well, now let's do redo this second one down here. And same things, but now we're going to say the equity risk premium equals 8%. Is 8% the right number? I don't know. Um, it's probably a little bit too high given historicals, but for our exercise, it's fine. So here, what do we got to do? Well, we got to do the risk-free rate, which is 10% plus the beta of 1.3 times, and in this case, we're just going to use this 8% as the equity risk premium. And so if we do this, what happens? Well, notice instead of in, in the previous one, what do we get? We got uh, only 1% out of what's in these parentheses here. 
So instead, if we take 1.3 times the 8, that gets us 10.4, 10% equals 20.4%. And that should be our required rate of return uh, based upon us saying, hey, we require 8% above whatever the risk-free rate is, the three-month treasury, in our return. And so I probably went a little bit further than needed to if you're just trying to learn the capital asset pricing model. And most likely, they'll give you the expected market return and they'll give you a risk-free rate. Uh, but just understand that uh, really that parentheses is meant to identify the equity risk premium, meaning the amount of return you're going to require above a riskless you know, three-month tre treasury bill. And it's also going to reflect how much more volatile that a, an individual stock is compared to the overall market. Um, there's also some controversy about even betas and using those or using variance as the main uh, source of risk. Uh, but that's for another discussion. So um, just remember that if you get this, the formula, the expected return of your asset is going to be the risk-free rate plus the beta times, that's supposed to be beta, and they'll either say the equity premium or the expected return of the market, the market minus the risk-free rate. Okay, hopefully that helps and explains it a little bit for you.